Hi, so uh, I'm Robert Haas, and I am a PostgreSQL uh, major contributor and committer, and I work at EnterpriseDB, where I am the chief architect uh, for the database server. And uh, today I'm going to be talking with a lot of echo um, about uh, the elephants in the room or limitations of the PostgreSQL core technology. Uh, and before I get to that, I want to first say that PostgreSQL is a great database. So, um, you know, it's got a reputation for stability and for standards compliance. Um, it has a whole bunch of uh, great features, some of which no other major relational database system has, such as transactional DDL. Um, you can begin a transaction, create an index, drop a table, and then you can roll it back and undo whatever you just did. That's pretty cool. Um, PostgreSQL also has a strong ecosystem of supporting products that do all kinds of interesting things. Uh, one example is PostGIS, which brings geospatial capabilities to the database. Um, it's got a great community, and it's open source. So please don't take anything that I say in this talk to mean that PostgreSQL is bad. That's not my point. Um, my point is rather, wow, that's a lot of echo. Um, I think the problem is I have this mic on too. Okay, um, so uh, my point is, okay, can somebody stand up there and advance the slide when I, uh, when I need to do that? John, can you, thanks. Um, so, um, so my point is rather that we've gotten to a certain level of success that we have today with PostgreSQL, and these are the things that I think we need to do in order to get to uh, the next level of success. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, if you are a longtime member of the PostgreSQL community, you may be tempted to look at some of these issues that I'm going to talk about today and say, ah, you know, yeah, that's really an issue, but it's not really that big of a problem. Well, I think it is a big problem, or it wouldn't be in the talk. Uh, on the other hand, especially if you're a newcomer to PostgreSQL, uh, you might be tempted to say, oh my gosh, PostgreSQL has problems. I totally shouldn't. I totally shouldn't use that. And that's not the right reaction either. Don't panic. Uh, these are problems, but they're things we can fix uh, or, uh, and, and, and uh, end up with an even better system uh, than we have today. So, uh, wow, now there's two people up there. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting very crowded. So, um, yeah, so here's my list of elephants. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide because all of these things have their own slides. So next slide. Um, so PostgreSQL currently uses buffered I.O., which means that when, you, uh, read, when we read a page into shared buffers, it first gets copied into the operating system's page cache, and from there, it gets copied into shared buffers. When we write a page, we write it out from shared buffers to the operating system page cache, and then the operating system eventually writes it back to disk. PostgreSQL is pretty much the only major relational database that does this. Um, and it might be a bad idea. We should at least consider whether it's a bad idea. One of the problems is that it is very likely that the, buff that the buffers which are present in shared buffers will also be present in the operating system cache. And if you cache two copies of something, that means that you're going to have to cache zero copies of something else that you otherwise could have cached one copy of. And, and that's not so good. Um, another problem that I've become aware of recently is that newer SSDs offer a, a feature called atomic rights. And this is pretty cool. PostgreSQL has a system which actually is actually quite an expensive system that we use to protect against the possibility that the system may lose power right in the middle of writing an eight kilobyte page. So part of that page ends up on disk, and the other part of the write doesn't happen because that's when you ran out of power, okay? Um, but this atomic write functionality offers potentially a way out of that. You do an 8K write, and you say, it's all or nothing. Either get this whole thing to disk or just forget the whole thing. And these SSDs have this, and it's exposed via a Linux kernel API that you cannot use with buffered I.O. You can only use it if you're using direct I.O. Sucks for us. Um, so given these things, you might ask, 
why in the world do we use buffered I.O.? And the reason that's traditionally given is that uh, we think that the kernel is going to do a much better job of scheduling I.O. than we're going to be able to do ourselves. Um, and uh, we don't want to re-implement the smarts that are in the kernel, so let's just take advantage of the kernel getting smarter and smarter rather than re-implementing ourselves. But I don't think that's really what's going on here. What I think is happening mostly is that buffered I, is that buffered I.O. allows us to paper over the times when we make bu bad buffer eviction decisions. Uh, next slide. OK. Um, so here's a graph that my colleague Jan Wieck made um, as a result of some PG Bench runs that he did. Um, the blue line on here shows the number of transactions per second that we got during uh, each second of this test. And as you can see, it's very spiky. Some of the time, it's up between 1,500 and 2,000, and other times, it's down near zero, which is obviously not what we'd like to see. Um, but then Jan made a really interesting observation uh, explaining why that's happening. The shaded red area on this graph shows the number of dirty buffers at each point during the test. And if you look, what you can see is every time the number of dirty buffers go, starts to go down, our performance tanks. Every, every time when that red number is sloping down because the kernel is doing those delayed writes to disk that I was talking about, our performance uh, dies. So I, when you see things like this, you really have to say, so just how intelligent is that kernel I.O. scheduler that we're supposedly <laughs> benefiting from? I'm not saying there aren't other ways to improve this, but that doesn't look good. All right, that's all I got to say about direct I.O. If you're not mad yet, wait till you see the next section. <laughs> OK, so the next thing I want to talk about is our on-disk format. Uh, this is another graph from Jan. Um, it shows the results of running a TPCC-like benchmark on PostgreSQL 9.3 and also on another database product. Okay. <laughs> now, you can see that at, in the first 30-minute run, this was a series of 30-minute runs, the first 30-minute run uh, we did uh, pretty darn well, but we couldn't sustain it. As we did additional runs on the same data set, our performance declined, and the performance of the other database product uh, remained much steadier, which kind of stinks, right? The reason for that is the size of our data. We started out about a third larger, and both databases grew over the duration of the test, but by the end of eight runs, we were 80% larger than the other product. Well, being 34% larger isn't great. Being 80% larger is really pretty bad, right? This is not going to happen on every workload. It's not going to happen in all situations. But on this test, in this workload, that's what happened. It's not good. And which kernel version that was? I don't know which kernel version that was. OK, Accor <laughs> according to Andres, who talked to Jan, it's 2.6.32. No, you, you can't ask that. OK, so, um, so, so there's two basic problems here, right? Our data is too big, and it grows too fast. And both of those things happen for a variety of reasons. The data is too big because one, one big reason is that our tuple headers are huge compared to most other products. They're 23 bytes. It doesn't sound like a lot. But when you got millions or billions of tuples, it adds up. Um, we waste space on alignment padding. I'm not sure how significant that is. And there are data type specific issues where we just don't do a great job in some cases of cramming down values into the absolute minimum number of bytes possible. That doesn't sound serious. Sometimes it's not serious. But when you have enough data, again, those bytes start to add up to, to very significant amounts of space. Um, and we grow too much. 
Improving vacuum, as we've done over the years, is good. Don't get me wrong, it's very good. It's made life much better for so many people. But it only contains bloat. It does not prevent it. Um, the other product on that slide there can update rows in place without having to put another copy of the row into the table and then later come back and get rid of it. Uh, and that is, uh, of course, uh, a huge benefit on a test like this because a, a table that is update only, where you just replace uh, one version of the row with another version of the row that's the same size and another version of the row that's the same size and another version of the row that's the same size, you zero out your growth on that kind of table. There were other tables here where, where both products increase, uh, uh, experienced an increase in database size, um, but uh, but there were some tables where the other product had no growth, and we had growth. Yeah? Uh, so the question was whether... <laughs> Okay, I totally missed something there. Someone's phone, Siri came on and said, I'm sorry, you said something. Okay, so uh, the question is, does this other product require that the rows be fixed size? No, it doesn't. It has some method of coping with that. It's complicated. I'm not here to explain how said other product works. Um, so uh, you know, a related problem is that when you're able to update rows in place, then you only need to insert new index entries for the, uh, for the indexes where the corresponding value has changed. We've got hot updates, which are great. They touch no indexes. But, when the index, but if even one index column is updated, we then have to go insert index entries for all of the indexes, not just the ones where the value changed, but for all of them. And so there's stuff we can squeeze out here, right? There's an opportunity for optimization. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about the on disk format. Okay, so now I wanna talk about replication. Um, and uh, I think uh, the first question about replication is, well, why do people replicate data? There's a bunch of reasons. There's high availability. Um, it, you have two copies of your data so that if your main server goes down, you can fail over to another server that has a copy of all that data. Um, you might want to do a database version upgrade. So you install a new version of the server, replicate everything over, and then swing your traffic when you're ready. Um, Multi-master replication, if you have geographically distributed stuff, um, that's a use case. Uh, and then there's read scaling. And, you know, I think it's important to emphasize that all of these things are things that you can do today, um, but the only one that I think we've really nailed is the high availability use case. Um, streaming replication uh, works really well for that, it's really reliable, does a great job. These other use cases, there are lots of tools available, um, but uh, you may end up with a combination of tools, you may end up using different tools for different purposes. The list of ways that you can do these things on this slide is not intended to be comprehensive, so if I've left out somebody's favorite tool for doing one of these things, I, I apologize for that. Um, but, uh, um, um, but you do tend to end up with a bunch of different uh, tools to do these things. Um, and so basically, up until 9.4, you only had two real ways of doing replication. You could use streaming replication, which was great for what it did, right, which was mostly high availability, although there's definitely ways with additional tooling to use that for read scale out. And then you had trigger-based replication solutions. Uh, which were a lot more flexible, let you do a lot more different kinds of things, uh, but there were issues around the performance of those solutions, the complexity of those solutions, and frankly, there were also issues with adoption. I mean, 
how many people in this, I mean, how many people in the PostgreSQL community have written a trigger-based replication solution for PostgreSQL? I know I've done it. Anybody else? Yeah, so there's like at least 10 people in this room who have done that, right? And so what that leads to is a fragmentation of the developer community. Many of these solutions, even really well-established ones that lots and lots of people are using, wow, only have one or two people working on them, and that's not a great thing. And the user communities are also split. Um, so in 9.4, we got a big step forward here, uh, which is we got logical decoding. So you can have a process that reads the right ahead log and turns that back into a stream of inserts and updates and deletes. Andres, did that work? It's really cool. Um, yay, Andres. <laughs> but we're not out of the woods yet because you can't use logical decoding unless you have a replication framework that knows how to use uh, logical decoding. Um, and we need a lot more here. We need to be able to answer all of those use cases that I had on the previous slide with simple, reliable, high-performance, well-supported solutions that are, that are in core. We need that. That's all I'm going to say about replication. By the way, the patches for all of these things are, are due next week, so you guys better get coding. <laughs> all right. Yeah, OK. So now I want to talk about horizontal scalability. And I think one of the really important questions that comes up with horizontal scalability is, do we really need that? And it, it's not a dumb question. I mean, database sizes are growing uh, rapidly, but you can get really big servers these days. I mean, you can get a commodity server with a terabyte, even two terabytes of memory in it. And then you can put your whole database in memory. And if you can put your whole database in memory, you can probably make that database pretty fast, right? And these aren't even enormously expensive boxes. Um, and a lot of people's databases are nowhere near that big, a gigabyte, 10 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes. That's easy to fit in memory if you want to and you, your controller isn't too tight-fisted. You know, you can solve that problem. Um, so while there are certainly people who have databases that are tens of terabytes, hundreds of terabytes, petabytes, um, there's a, an awful lot of smaller databases where horizontal scalability maybe is not really uh, as, uh, as big of an issue as maybe we sometimes think it is. Um, one case where it is a problem, though, is with write scaling. It is much easier to put more memory into a machine and make that machine able to cache a larger database than it is to get that database, that, that same machine to be able to write lots and lots of data changes to disk really, really fast. That is still a hard problem to solve. Um, another reason why people say, well, you know, maybe we don't really need horizontal scalability is that, you know, it's often better to push some of the logic about knowing where the data is back into the application. Instead of just throwing everything into one massive database that is going to internally do all kinds of magic to spread your data around across multiple machines and everything is going to work wonderfully, it might be better to have some application level knowledge of where all of that data is located. Um, you can then partition the data in, in intelligent ways. I, I mean, the, the, the reality is that Network latency is much higher than memory latency, and that's not going to change. So putting related data together and being intentional about how you group your data together has a lot of value. And if you do that, you may very well find that there is never really a use case for uh, a, a scale-out architecture within the database. On the other hand, uh, there are certainly existing applications that were not written that way, and sometimes people need to take one of those applications and scale it up. Um, and maybe the biggest thing is, rightly or wrongly, people who love other systems uh, think that auto sharding works. 
and they don't like it that we haven't got it. Whether they're right or whether they're wrong, that's a little more arguable, but they think they're right. And if we don't provide that solution, they may decide that they're gonna use something else. So um, we've got a sort of a horizontal scalability uh, solution that has been maturing very slowly over the last five years. In PostgreSQL 9.1, we got foreign data wrappers so that you could access data on a remote machine using an SQL interface. Um, I think that was an enormously successful interface. Lots of people were, used it. Um, and it's been improved in every release since then um, in small ways. 9.2 got better planner support and statistics collection and a bunch of other little stuff. 9.3 got the ability for foreign data wrappers to write data as well as read it, which was very important change. It also got Postgres FDW into the core distribution so that using only code that was in the core, you could make Postgres talk to another Postgres. That's obviously really important. 9.4 got trigger support for foreign tables. Uh, and 9.5 Devel, as of a few days ago, uh, allows foreign tables to participate in inheritance, inheritance trees. And you guys may know that inheritance is sort of the way that we handle partitioning of data in PostgreSQL. So the ability to put foreign tables into inheritance degrees should sound a lot like the way we do sharding in, in PostgreSQL, which I think it will come to be. Um, but we need a lot more here. Um, there is a slide missing. Um, there, <laughs> there is a, a, a whole bunch more improvements that are needed to this architecture in order to really do scale out with it well. And we are creeping toward those improvements, but we are not getting there, I think, nearly as quickly as we really need to get there. For example, if you're selecting data from two foreign tables, uh, and you're joining them, you would like the join to be done on the remote node rather than on the local node. And right now, you won't get that. Probably even worse if you are, say, doing an aggregate over the data, like a really simple case is select count star from foreign table. What we're gonna do is ship all the rows back from the remote node to the local node and then count them locally. And it will be a lot more efficient to do the counting on the remote node and then just bring the count back and give it to the user. But we can't do that yet, right? And, and there are other things, too. To have a real sharding solution, you might, for example, want to have consistent visibility between a group of servers. And Postgres XC has developed technology to make that happen. But in core Postgres, we don't have that technology. So there's a whole bunch of different things that are needed, uh, that, that need to be done uh, in, order to, um, in order to really make this, uh, this technology production grade. A another, well not production grade, but to make it better and more capable and able to address a broader variety of use cases. Uh, another one is asynchronous scans, right? If you have foreign table, if you have multiple references to foreign tables in the same query, we could kick off all of those scans at once at the beginning of the query and then wait for the answers to start to come back. But today, we don't. We kick them off one at a time. And when the first one is done, we kick the second one off. And when the second one's done, we kick the third ones off. So it's sort of a poor man's version of parallelism. Uh, but it's, it's an important performance optimization, and, and we don't have it today. Going to be interested to see whether the slide that I just talked through without having it shows up later in the deck or if it's just totally gone. OK, so uh, another place where I think we need to improve is uh, parallel query. Obviously, a, a big part of the driver for this is that CPU and core thread, CPU core and thread counts are still increasing fairly rapidly, but single CPU performance is really not going anywhere. I mean, it's increasing a little bit, but it's extremely slow. Um, and so as your data grows, it becomes more and more urgent to be able to operate on that data with lots and lots of processes at the same time. 
Um, there's good news and bad news about parallel query. Uh, the good news is that uh, my colleague Amit Capilla and I have a basic implementation of parallel sequential scan that's pretty close to being done. Uh, I don't know whether it will go into 9.5. I, I think if it doesn't, it will go into 9.6. Um, there, there is still work to be done there, but I think we are getting fairly near to the end. We're certainly an off, despite Andres shaking his head over there, we are an awful lot, <laughs> we are an awful lot closer to the end than we are to the beginning. Um, and, and I feel pretty good about that. Unfortunately, by itself, parallel sequential scan is not going to get us where we want to be, right? We need other types of parallel scans. For example, somebody mentioned to me last night a parallel bitmap index scan. Um, if you imagine that you have a, a huge relation, you can use a bitmap index to figure out that 75% of that big relation you don't want to scan at all, but the remaining blocks you'd like to scan in parallel. So uh, we're going to need that. Uh, we're going to need parallel aggregates, parallel joins, uh, parallel utility commands, probably a bunch of other stuff that I don't have on here. There's going to be a lot of work, some in terms of implementing additional parallel operators, but also quite a bit of work in terms of making the query planner smarter uh, so that it can uh, come up with the best possible parallel plan using the operators that, that we have. Um, so, uh, you know, in one sense, I feel like I'm just about to complete what has really been a really long journey. I've been working on this for like a year and a half, and I might have another six months to go. Um, but on the other hand, there is an awful lot more that needs to happen after that. And my hope is that all of the infrastructure that I've been building uh, for this project over time uh, will... Um, will uh, make building the, the second installment of this a whole lot easier than building the first installment has been. Um, but we still, have to, we still have to get to number one before we can move on to number two. Um, so yeah. Um, and the last major area that I want to mention is connection pooling. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why people use connection pooling, and a lot of people who are using PostgreSQL today are using connection pooling. Connection poolers are, I think, one of the most popular add-on pieces of software for PostgreSQL. Uh, some people use pgpool. Uh, I think a lot of people recommend pgbouncer in cases where you can get away with it because it's simpler. Um, which, of course, has upsides and downsides, but if, if, if you can manage with simple, then that's better. Um, but I think we need to really give some serious consideration to why do we need connection pooling, and why do we tell all of our users that they need to go and install a connection pooler to solve problem X or problem Y or problem Z? And I think in order to answer that question, we need to sort of list what the use cases are. And I listed the, the five uh, that I kind of know of uh, on the slide here. Load balancing, right? You're, you've got a bunch of read replicas, and you're using your connection pooler to direct some connections to one server and other connections to another server. Uh, high availability, your connection pooler is going to reroute the connection from one server to another server in the case that you have a failover event. Um, admission control, you don't want the database server to get slammed by a huge number of processes all trying to do very complicated things all at the same time and totally swamp the machine. So you use the connection pooler to throttle the rate that queries are hitting the database um, to avoid the overhead of backend startup and shutdown, which is relatively expensive in PostgreSQL. And, and even for replication, where you actually have the connection pooler run the SQL statements that it thinks are going to write data on multiple machines so that if the stars align and everything works absolutely perfectly, you will have two copies of your data. Um, and all of this is fine, right? There's a lot of useful solutions that can, build, that can be built this way, but there are some disadvantages. Having an external connection pooler in the loop um, increases administrative complexity. Um, it adds an additional point of failure. Uh, I can't 
conveniently count the number of times that people said, well, I don't have to worry about my database going down because my connection pooler will reroute the connections to another machine. And then I said, what if the connection pooler goes down? Uh, I didn't think about that. Um, and, and of course, connection poolers also add latency because now every protocol message between the database and the client has this additional hop that it's got to jump through uh, in both directions. Um, and you know, I think to some degree we're relying on the connection pooling to solve problems that we would really be better off if we could solve those problems in the core database server. For example, admission control I think is a particularly clear example of this. Why should it be the user's problem to make sure that the database server doesn't get more connections at a time that it can handle gracefully? Should it not rather be the problem of the database server to say, wait a minute, you just sent me a query, but I'm overloaded right now, so you've got to wait. It's exactly the same thing doing that in the database server as it is doing that in the connection pooler, except that you need one fewer component to make it work. And you don't have this additional complexity, point of failure, latency. Um, so, uh, so PostgreSQL is already a tremendously successful system. Uh, it's being used by a lot of people to solve a lot of really complicated problems. It's being used by a huge number of uh, big companies. I know that because they're our customers. Uh, and, uh, and what we should do is we should try to make that system even better. And what I've tried to do in this talk is sort of outline uh, some of the uh, areas where I think the big work needs to be done. Obviously, there's a lot of small things about PostgreSQL all over the code base here and there. You can find, well, we could tweak this thing and make it a little better. We could tweak that thing and make it a little better. But these, to me, are sort of the the, 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 the big things, the really large projects, probably multi-year projects to really start making headway on these um, and, uh, um, uh, and get to some place that's really exciting. Um, I think in the areas of logical replication and horizontal scalability and parallel query, we've made a start. The logical replication work, as I said before, is really due to, to Andres. Um, uh, and of course, uh, Simon and everyone at Second Quadrant who, uh, who uh, made that possible and all the people who helped fund it. The horizontals, and, and, and I reviewed it. Yes, I, I did review it. Uh, and the horizontal scalability uh, stuff has been really led by some of the Japanese guys. Um, and they just need more time. We need more people to spend more time on those solutions to make them better. Uh, and of course, parallel query is, uh, is largely uh, my work with help from a bunch of other people at Enterprise DB. So we've made a start on all of those areas, but we need to do a lot more uh, in order to ensure total world domination. Um, dr in some of the other areas that I mentioned, direct I.O. and changes to the storage format and building in connection pooling technology, we really haven't tackled those issues. We think of those as things like, like, oh yeah, you know, it would be really great to do something about that, but it would be so much work, I I'm not gonna do that project. And then we find some other area of the code to improve. And so I think these are things that we really need to think about doing uh, in, order to, uh, in order to make the product better. Um, my final note here is please help. Like, you, not somebody else, you help. Um, there's a tremendous amount that goes into building these solutions. Um, you know, I and my colleagues uh, on the PostgreSQL uh, mailing lists who are committers play one role in that, which is to decide when the code is at a level where it is ready to go in and become part of a product that's going to be unleashed on all of you. But that is far from being the only important role. Um, there is review by lots of people that is needed to get those patches to the level of quality where we feel comfortable giving them to all of, all of you. There is the writing of those patches, 
someone's got to write the code. Um, there is the funding <laughs> of all of that activity. Those patches do not get written by volunteers. They get people who are paid by PostgreSQL companies. There are certainly some patches that get written by volunteers, but to make progress on these big problems, we need more than that. We need people whose job it is to write those patches, and that requires money. So all of the people here who work at PostgreSQL companies uh, will be familiar with where the money to fund this comes from, and that's, that's from customers, right? So we need help from, from people financially writing the code, reviewing the code, committing the code, and then, and this is also a very important part, discussing what the solutions should look like and testing them once they are available to make sure that they actually meet the needs that you have. So even if you're not a coder, and even if you uh, don't have any money, um, there are still a lot of things that you can do to help make PostgreSQL uh, even better. Because if you just leave it up to people getting around, to other people getting around to doing something about these problems, well, it'll probably happen, but it might take a really long time. So please contribute to that effort uh, in any way that you can. Um, somehow I'm ahead on time, which may be attributable to the fact that I spent the last week being frantically worried about being behind on time. So I'm done. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, I've actually got time for those. So thanks. Yeah. Right, so the question is, how much of the process is deciding on what the solution should be and how much of it is actually coding it? Um, I, I think it, it is both. What I would say about that is that if you are the kind of guy who writes code, and many people in this room are whether you are or not, you may have a tendency to think that writing the code is the important part of the problem and that the deciding what it should do is the kind of BS thing that the community makes you do before you get to the important part, which is writing the code. Um, I don't think the evidence bears that out, right? I actually think that that process of figuring out what the solution should be, which is sometimes called design, uh, <laughs> it, is actually an incredibly important part of the process, and I think that uh, you know, uh, Andres and I have reviewed each other's patches a lot, and both of us go crazy with the things that the other person tells us we need to change in our patches. But the patches get better, right? Not everything that the other person suggests is an improvement, um, but that's going to be true in any relationship that you have with another person in any situation, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, yeah, the, the, the design and the discussion of the design and the discussion of how the feature should work and all that kind of stuff, it, that is a really important part of the problem. And all of the things that I talked about here are very complex in terms of figuring out what are the right next steps. But I don't think that as developers we should step back from that and say, well, geez, there's no hope in working on this project because I'm going to have to figure out a design. You should figure out a design. And even if the design is the only part of it that you can help with, that's okay. That's great. That's a huge contribution to help us understand what the design should be. I think that comes out in the logical replication discussions where one of the things that's come up is, well, we're going to need control mechanisms for this to control what gets replicated and how it gets replicated and all of that kind of stuff. And do we really know what those should, mechanisms should look like. Because if we don't know the use cases, we might end up designing some, putting something into the core product that everybody has to live with for 10 years that really isn't that good. And we definitely don't want that to happen. So, um, yeah. Yeah.
beyond just saying, okay, well, you know, we have 20 connections available. Um, workload management or resource management or, you know, how many users, uh, of, of a particular user set, I think that these are things that are important to us as well. So um, I'm wondering if, if that's something that goes along with that, that thought process in your mind or um, is that more sort of day two stuff? Yeah, I think, I think resource management as a general concept is a pretty important concept because we've got lots of evidence that when you overconsume a certain resource, uh, the performance of the system goes downhill a lot. Um, in Enterprise DB's fork of PostgreSQL, we actually built a resource limiting mechanism into our version 9.4. Um, and I think it is very likely that the community will eventually do things uh, in that area a, a, as well. Um, uh, so yeah, I think resource limitation is part of it. In, in many ways, the, the transaction, uh, um, the, 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 the limiting of the number of active transactions could be a proxy for limiting a lot of other kinds of resource utilization. And I don't actually know what's best here, which gets back to that whole design question, right? Exactly what is the best thing and how do you limit and how do you limit it? Um, limiting connections is one thing. We've done a couple of other things that you can limit in, in, in Advanced Server 9.4, but some experimentation and testing will be needed in order to figure out which of those things are actually most valuable to people in which use cases. Right. Uh -huh. um, which is interesting. Um, it is, although... Although that's only so accurate. Right, that's only so accurate. It, like, it turns out that your plan costing can be way off, and you can still get the right plans almost all the time. Yeah, so adding right. more dependencies on the plan cost is, is a little yeah. iffy. Yeah. But, yeah, Greg. So uh, Greg's question is whether I have anything to say about a particular topic. <laughs> um, uh, but more specifically, his question about, is, is about trade-offs and, and what do you do when a particular change is going to make things better for some people and worse for other people? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think you have to consider it in specific. I'm not aware of a, a reason why using direct I.O. would be better for some people than other people, or why it would regress anyone, it probably would help people on large databases more. Because there's an awful lot of Postgres databases in the world where, let's face it, there's not that much happening, right? People spin up a database because they need a database, but it may, it, it may not actually process very many transactions. I mean, we have, a, we have an actual customer that I was working with on a support ticket and their transaction volume was, I think, one commit per week. <laughs> but that commit, but that commit was really important, right? Okay, and y you laugh, but no, seriously, that commit was really important. I can't tell you what it was, but trust me, it was important. Okay. Uh, and we're having a little raffle here for a training. And then I'll take that question. Of course, I can't read this one. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wins a free training. It looks like it's Ryan Malaki. OK. You're here? All right. You win a free training. Woo. You got a question? Oh, it's a great idea. It would just be better if you didn't have to. Okay. Initial control is a great idea. Having initial control in connection pooling is not necessarily a great idea because the connection pooling can't necessarily know its own state and can make bad decisions about when to allow or deny the stream to go through. They would have to have global state calling across all the connections and to know, no, I'm never having to send this through or I'm allowing 
Right. So, so there are definitely problems with the, with the connection pooling, maybe making bad prioritization decisions about which queries to run what right away and which ones to put off. Nevertheless, there are people getting enormous performance benefits out of using, using connection pooling. I mean, really huge benefits. Um, so, you know, yes, you could possibly make some of those things smarter if you put them in the core database, and that's why I think we should consider doing that. But people are also solving these problems in the connection pooler very effectively. Um, my, my colleague, Kevin Grittner, who's not here today, will be happy to talk your ear off about what he did at the Wisconsin courts, which basically involved limiting a, a huge volume of transactions down to something like 30 database connections and seeing response times just go through the roof. And to do that, he had multiple prioritization levels and multiple pools so that certain things didn't interfere with other things. So it's tricky, but it, 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 and it'll probably remain tricky even if some cases will probably remain tricky even if we have something in core. Uh, but the benefits really are there. If anybody in this room has a server with 500 database connections as a typical setup, you should probably put a connection pooler in there and it will probably be faster if you, t if you tune it right and force that down to be shared among a smaller number of connections. Peter. Uh, so Peter's question is about the importance of improving our caching algorithm. I think if we want to give direct IO a try, it's going to be absolutely necessary. Because if you make a bad page eviction decision uh, when you are using buffered IO, it's not great, but it's not that bad either. Because you write the page over to the OS, and then you're like, oh crap, I need that page again. And you read it back in from the OS cache. And so you copied an extra 8K of data out, you copied an extra 8K of data in, you had a couple of system calls. It's not wonderful, but it's not terrible. Um, if you make a bad decision about writing a page out to disk, and you write it out to the, physically write it out to the disk and forget it completely from all of your caches so that you avoid cache duplication, and then you discover that you need that page, it is a lot more expensive to go get that page back. So to have any hope of using direct I.O., we would really have to make sure that our decisions about which things to cache and which things not to cache were absolutely top notch. Uh, otherwise, we'll get creamed. Yeah? Sort of in that same vein, is there any technical reason why uh, OSomics requires both direct if other than that, the way Linux kernel is now, can that be? So the, the Linux kernel developers, I, I think, to, to describe why Oatomic used Odirect, I think they were using words like nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not a Linux kernel developer, so I can stand here and say, those guys are all weenies, and you know, they should really just uh, figure out a way to do that, and maybe they will. Um, it would be nice if they did, but it doesn't seem like they have any plans to do that right now. I do understand kind of why it's complicated, right? Which is that if you do a direct write, all you've got to do is go and write it, and then when the write is done, you can forget that that was supposed to be an atomic write. If it's a buffered write and has to go in the operating system buffer cache, you have to remember whenever it eventually gets written out, this range of bytes has to all be written out atomically. And by then, more atomic writes have, may have come along even in overlapping byte ranges, which wouldn't be an issue for us. We would not have overlapping byte ranges, but you know, in general, if they're going to support that in the kernel, they have to cater to those possibilities. So it's probably a tricky problem to solve that with buffered I.O. Might not be totally impossible, but, but tricky, definitely tricky. Jeff. Absolutely. And uh, the earlier you get
Right, so Jeff is absolutely right. And you know, uh, one way of saying that is complain early and complain often. Uh, <laughs> you know, because, because, I mean, I don't run a production database. I develop database code, right? And I have run production databases, but I don't do it right now. And I haven't run your production database. So knowing for me and for, I think, for every PostgreSQL developer, having feedback from people at conferences and on mailing lists and, and at every other opportunity that presents itself to know what would be most helpful to you. I mean, you, you've seen the things I talked about today come up to me or any, other, or the, any of the other hackers in the room after this and say which things you think are most important for you, which things are least important for you. Uh, the input's always really helpful. Um, I think that we are out of time, uh, so thank you everybody for coming and uh, I'll be around if you wanna grab me afterward.